from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Amen. Jesus the King. Amen. Just because we live in a democratic country doesn't mean we don't have a king. Amen. Amen. We do have a king. The events that we look at this morning are recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each of them tells about the Jewish leaders bringing Jesus Christ, our Savior, to Pilate. He was the Roman governor of the time, and these Jewish leaders demanded that Pilate send Jesus to his death. Now this is all a familiar story to many of us, and I think there is a danger we face in reading such a familiar story in the Bible, and, and that is that it will be easy for us to throw our minds into neutral because we've heard this story all before so many times. I would ask you this morning, don't let it go in one ear and out the other this morning as we talk about all those events surrounding the trial of Jesus. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will use this message to help us all realize again how much God really loves us. How much God loves you. As we look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 15 and Matthew chapter 27, I want us to seek answers to some questions. First of all, let us read the scripture today. And as we look to the Gospel of Matthew, we'll begin reading at verse 1, chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you said, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. And so again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at, the, at this feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. 
Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Now if you would turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, and I will begin reading at verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Amen. Our Lord God, as we have read your scripture, I pray that you will open up our hearts and our minds to what you would teach us today, Lord, from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like for us to seek the answer to these four questions. And First of all, why did Pilate react with amazement to the silence of Jesus? As you remember, Jesus was arrested late at night. And he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he had taken, been taken immediately to be interrogated before the high priest and the ruling council. But Jewish law said that any trial at night was illegal. But they did it anyway. And then they met again at dawn to make formal charges against Jesus because they had accused him of blasphemy, which was the slandering or showing contempt for God. And they knew that the charge of blasphemy wouldn't stand with the Romans. You see, the Romans believed in many gods, and the charge of blasphemy against a god would not be considered a crime in a Roman court. And so they had to come up with more significant charges. And they did. They came up with three more charges against Jesus, just so they could bring him before the Romans. They said that Jesus was to be charged with subversion against Rome. They said that Jesus was to be charged with teaching that people shouldn't pay taxes to the Romans. And they came up with a charge that Jesus was conspiring against Rome, claiming to be Christ, claiming to be a king and that the people should listen to him and not to Rome. Yes, the Jewish leaders came up with three false charges against Jesus. But it was this last accusation that caused Pilate to ask the question. He said to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers that question, but not in a strong voice, the kind of voice that we were used to reading him use as he addressed the Pharisees, all throughout his ministries and all of their questioning to him. We knew that Jesus was always in control of the situation. But in this instance, you'll notice that Jesus is not answering in a strong, forceful manner. In control of the conversation as he often was. Why didn't he speak as no other person had ever spoke before? Why didn't Jesus raise his head? Why would he appear so downcast? Why couldn't he convince Pilate that he indeed was the king, not only of the Jews, but to all of mankind? Jesus remembers Gethsemane. That was on his mind his conversation with his father. 
Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus knew what had to be done. Jesus didn't raise his voice to Pilate. He simply said, yes, it is as you say. Then lowered his head again. It is as you say. Why did he answer that way? Why do you suppose such a short response to such a big question? And I think as we reflect on what the other gospel writers write about Jesus' answer here, we begin to realize that Jesus was trying to set Pilate at ease. Not being threatening to Pilate. I don't want your authority, Pilate. I don't want your job, Pilate. Pilate, I don't want your authority. I don't want your throne. I'm here as a sacrifice. I think Pilate understood as he had this private conversation with Jesus, Pilate understood that this man was not a threat to anybody. And he had decided, I think, at this point, to set Jesus free. Frustrated, the chief priests became very aggressive in their accusations. They started throwing all kinds of insults and accusations out keeping one charge on top of another that were all false. And Pilate, he says to Jesus, aren't you going to answer these accusations against you? Jesus remained quiet. Jesus remembered Gethsemane and his conversation with the Father. And Pilate persists and he says, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? Jesus made no reply. Not even to a single charge. And Pilate is amazed. He's amazed at this man standing before him. Why was he amazed? And I think Pilate was waiting for one word from Jesus. Just one word. That would give Pilate an excuse and a basis for releasing Jesus. Just one word. But Jesus never said that one word. You know, when you read a bit further on, you find that the chief priests and the scribes were all around the cross as Jesus hung on the cross, and they said he saved others, but he can't save himself. Well, you know, that's far from the truth that we could ever imagine. Because Jesus could have saved himself. Jesus could have. And all that Jesus really had to do was speak up in his own defense. But Jesus remembered the assembly and the conversation he had with the Father. Sure, Pilate would have turned Jesus loose. Jesus could have said any number of things to convince Pilate. Jesus had that kind of testimony. Because he gave that kind of testimony persuasively to so many people that began to follow him throughout his public ministry. Pilate knew that Jesus had done nothing worthy of crucifixion. And in Matthew 27, 19, we discover that even Pilate's wife knew it. But Jesus offered no defense. And Pilate was amazed. Why doesn't he defend himself? Why doesn't he plead for his life? But Jesus remembered this sentence. But we know why, don't we, why Jesus never said anything. Because the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. We know the reason. And it says in Romans 8 and 5 or chapter 5 and verse 8 as we hear the words of Paul God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us we know the reason why Jesus didn't say anything 
In John 3.17, Jesus said, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Yes, we know the reason why Jesus didn't save the world. We know the reason. Jesus just stood there and He was quiet because He remembered His last conversation with His Father in Heaven in this seven. Now the second question is this. Why did the crowd choose Barabbas instead of Jesus? Why did that happen? Why did He choose Barabbas instead of Jesus? You know, Barabbas is an interesting character, not mentioned anywhere else but here in the Bible. And he's mentioned in all four of the Gospel accounts. And his name means Son of the Father. And historians tell us that his given name was Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. So his name, much the same as Jesus the Christ. But Barabbas is a rebel. He's a zealot. He's a member of a group of assassins called the Sicarii. And they were all zealots that would go around and persuade people to help them to kill the Romans. And finally they were caught in Barabbas. He was caught in the act and put in prison. Beside him, on the other side of Pilate stands Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the Heavenly Father. Jesus uses love and wisdom and compassion and mercy with people. And Jesus changed people's lives for the good. And He stood there and there was Barabbas, and the people wanted the murderer instead of the redeemer and the healer. The decision was clear, as clear as it could be. Will the people choose violence, or will they choose love? Will they choose hatred, or will they choose mercy? What will the people do? The crowd voted overwhelmingly. Set free Barabbas. Why did they vote that way? Why did the people decide to have Barabbas set in their midst again? You know, this is much the same crowd that not too many days before were singing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King, as Jesus had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And now they were calling for his death. They were ready to serve. And they didn't know that Jesus was the one that was ready to serve. Jesus was ready. They thought that the Messiah would be a man of obvious power and strength. But Jesus made no defense before Pilate. A person they thought not of strength, but of weakness. They thought the Messiah would come in all of His glory riding on a horse and help them to take their country back from the Romans. Have you ever been disappointed in God? There have been times when God didn't do what I wanted Him to do. And there have been times when He didn't answer prayers the way I prayed for Him to answer prayers. And there have been times when He didn't solve my problems just the way I thought. He should solve my problems. And there have been times when God has disappointed me. Perhaps you have felt that way too in your life, but never admitted it. But Scripture here teaches that God's ways aren't our ways. And God's thoughts aren't our thoughts. His ways and thoughts are greater than ours, the Bible tells us. In fact, the Bible teaches that our greatest and wisest thoughts are His foolishness when compared to God. 
The crowd of people were disappointed because Jesus didn't do what they thought that He should do. So because of that, they shouted for Barabbas. How about us? Do we really want a God in this day and age that we can manipulate? Do we want a God who always does what we want Him to do? Or do we want a God whose ways are higher than our ways? A God that we can go to any time of the day or night and know He's going to be there. Who always does what is best for us, whether we realize it or not. What kind of God do you want? Why did Pilate have Jesus flogged before His crucifixion? After all this had taken place, Jesus is brought before Pilate. Once again, and Pilate sends him away for a flogging. He's stripped to the waist. His hands are tied together over his head to a post. And the cat of nine tails, embedded with bits of jagged metal and bone, and bone is used as a whip, and Jesus is whipped. Flogged, as they call it. Why would Pilate do that? Why? The people that wanted him to be crucified, isn't crucifixion enough? A few minutes before Pilate wanted to release Jesus. Why would he be so cruel to have Jesus beaten and then brought before the people again in that condition? Why would he do that? I think the answer is this, that Pilate was hoping that when Jesus was brought before them and they saw what condition that he was in, the pitiful sight that they would have mercy on him. They would say, that's enough, there's no need for him to go to the cross. He suffered enough for what he's charged with. And Pilate was saying the Romans had nothing to charge him with. And I did this much for you to punish him for what you say he did. And Pilate was expecting them to say that's enough. So here stands Jesus. His clothing soaked with his own blood. And his head is bowed before them and Pilate said, Behold the man. But the crowd shouted with even greater intensity, Crucify him, crucify him. The crowd that once shouted Hosanna to the highest for Jesus as he came into their town. Satan has a hold of this crowd now and the ugliness of the crowd comes out and it's demonstrated as they cry all the louder. Scripture says crucify him. And the last question, why did the soldiers treat Jesus with such obvious hatred and cruelty before they crucified him? How could people be so cruel to someone who has become so defenseless before them? Notice Matthew in his gospel said, they gathered the whole company of soldiers. The whole company of soldiers. There could have been as many as 600 in the garrison simply because of the fact that Pilate had come from Caesarea to Jerusalem to be there during the Passover feast. And while some of them were on duty, some were off duty. A large number of soldiers were gathered there. And they came where Jesus was and they began to mock Him. Have you ever been mocked by somebody in front of other people? And they put a scarlet robe on his shoulders and a crown of thorns on his head. They put a staff in his hand. They knelt down in front of him. They spat at his face. They took the staff and then they struck him in the head with him over and over and over again while he had that crown of thorns in his scalp. Why did the Roman soldiers react so violently and so cruelly to someone 
who cannot defend themselves. Why? They said, Hail, King of the Jews. You know, and I think they were taking out their frustration and their hatred of the Jews on Jesus. Many of them just wanted to be back on the coast in Caesarea or home in Italy. They didn't want to be in this hot, obtrusive country where the Jewish people who had a reputation for being rebellious over the years lived. They did not like the Jews. The Roman soldiers were being killed by the zealots. So they were taking it out on Jesus. He was in their hands and they made him pay for everything that was done. Well, in conclusion, I want to draw your attention to something that Peter said. You know who Peter was? Peter was a disciple and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus chose him to follow him, and Peter agreed, okay, I'll follow you. And he followed him for over three years. In our scripture reading today, we know that Peter was so close to Jesus that he felt he could give him advice about anything. Peter was there for all the miracles. Peter was there as Jesus rebuked his adversaries. Peter was there when Jesus was taken in the middle of the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter was there when Jesus was on trial that evening in the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus was there. Jesus was there with Peter watching him. Watching him. Learning from him. He heard everything that Jesus ever said in his public ministry. Peter heard it. So is Peter somebody that we can believe, I would ask you this morning? Is what Peter says something that we should pay attention to here in the 21st century? He said in this scripture, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have to do that. The answer to all of these questions can be summed up in this one statement, my friends. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Do you hear what I'm saying, church? You want to know why to all of those questions? It's right here. Jesus died on the cross and put up with all the humiliation and the beating so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. When is that going to happen in our lives? That we would stop nitpicking God's Word and just follow it. That we would stop nitpicking the lives of other people and just be servants to them. That we would stop nitpicking our spouses and our children and grandchildren and just start serving them like Jesus wants us to. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. If you believe Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ and was a man that lived this earth, and you believe the Bible, then you believe these words and will apply them to your life. And as we look at the cross, we need to realize that all of our hatreds, our prejudices, our pride, our selfishness, our sins, drove the nails in His hands on that cross just as much as the Romans drove the nails. My friends, it's time to stop the sitting it's time to be honest with yourselves and with everyone else you come in contact with and stand up for Jesus Christ. Amen. It's time. What are you waiting for? And as we look at the cross, perhaps we have mixed emotions about all of this. Realize that the one who suffered, suffered there for you and me. Is that suffering all in vain? 
Are we going to keep on sinning? Or are we going to live in righteousness? Those are the important questions that we should be asking ourselves. Because of His suffering and His pain and His death, we can stand before God today forgiven and cleansed and redeemed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father God, thank you for the blessings and grace today. I pray that your words will penetrate our hearts in a most profound way and that we will continue to reflect upon Jesus in his last hours and what he went through just for each one of us. Let your will be done in our lives. Let us live under righteousness and not under sin. Guide us, Lord, with your own Holy Spirit as we go forward from here. And as we leave this place, Lord, let us celebrate the victory that we have in Jesus and that the grace that is continually flowing from heaven into all of our lives. And let your will be done. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen.